Wait. Making sense of history is easy. If you look where you're supposed to, listen when you're supposed to, and watch how you're supposed to, then you don't have to make sense of history at all. Someone else has already made sense of it. In Boston, we have the Freedom Trail, a red brick road that passes by the city's most historic gift shops. We call it a celebration of history, but it's just a series of objects. We join this history already in progress. Our story continues here at the James Michael Curley House at 350 Jamaica Way in Boston. It's known as the House with the Shamrock Shutters. This is not the only home that James Michael Curley lived in. This is the neighborhood where Curley was born. His impoverished childhood impacted his entire life, personally and politically. By the time he moved out of this home, he was the mayor, and he moved into a mansion he had built across the city. It was built with money nobody really knew the source of, but it was assumed that it was financed unethically and illegally. And that's the property that still stands, protected by the city as the mayor of the poor's legacy. Today, the property houses nothing. You can look at it from outside, you can walk around the yard, but you can't enter. You can't bring your dog. History is preserved. Curley was known for his energy, his demagoguery, and his persistence. He ran for 20 offices and lost nine times, so losing was a big part of his life. He took his opponents head on, even when he was bound to lose. And above all, he understood the power of language. Curley talked about his use of extreme language as a political necessity. In a pinch, swing hard, is what he said about his words. He studied oratory. He studied the classics. He studied Shakespeare. He knew the best way to construct a rousing speech, and yet, in a pinch swing hard, he's acknowledging power of words while hinting at their inherent untrustworthiness. He was known as a great public speaker, using language to stir emotions, and yet he distanced himself from the meaning of his words. Historians started thinking about words in the mid-20th century. They realized that just by using words, just by constructing history as a narrative, they were being subjective in their history telling. Historian Hayden White wrote a book called Meta History, 
in which he argued that all historians who write history in a narrative form are imposing their ideology on history, an ideology of cause and effect, linearity, and chronology. The idea that objectivity should be the goal in history telling is also subjective. That's because history isn't made, it's told. So if you want to affect change through history telling, you have to tell it in a new way. Hayden White coined a term about one such way of telling history in film. He never really described how it works, though, because he invented the term as an ideal, a hypothetical. So I'm not really sure if I'm doing it right. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. But at least I'm trying. This is Curly Plaza. These are statues of James Michael Curley, placed here in 1980, about 22 years after Curley's death. The one on the bench is supposed to be approachable because Curley was the mayor of the poor. Bostonians used to line up outside his house and ask for help, usually in the form of a job, and Curley would use his power and influence to get them a job. This is how he got to be unquestionably beloved and powerful in the city, by helping people, with the implication that the person he helped would then vote for him in the next election. This, some people say, is corruption. The statue sits silently, though, and does not offer any defense. <laughs> the other statue, Curly as governor, is less popular because he's just standing there staring off into space. What's he looking at? Well, he can see a statue of a later mayor of Boston, Kevin White, and he's looked upon more fondly today because allegations of his corruption never gained enough momentum to tarnish his reputation. He can see tourists shuffling into and out of Faneuil Hall, the historic landmark that sells postcards and plush lobsters on its first floor. And he can see the statue of Sam Adams, and I wonder how Curly would feel about having to look at a patriarch of one of the most famous Boston Brahmin families unceasingly for years and years. Throughout his career, Curly defined himself by his opposition to the Boston Brahmins. The Brahmins were the elite class of Anglo-blooded rich Protestants who lived in the Back Bay in Beacon Hill in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And though they represented only a portion of the city's population, they had virtually unchecked power over the city for generations, politically and economically. Boston looks upon the Brahmins with such reverence that their homes are preserved just as they were. That means they aren't subject to the same codes as other buildings. Several of the city's most expensive neighborhoods have no sprinklers, for example, because preserving the historic nature of the rich people's homes was determined more important. This year, two firefighters died in this building, where Oliver Wendell Holmes once lived. Football star Tom Brady lives next door. The current mayor of Boston uses in his office a desk called the Curly Desk. It's believed that this desk was used by Curly while he was mayor. The desk had gone missing for many years and was the subject of hometown mystery and urban folklore, but now it's back in the mayor's office. Mayor Walsh said he wanted to use the desk because, quote, it's about history. I would show it to you, but you can't just walk into the mayor's office and shoot his desk. But somewhere in this concrete fortress we call City Hall is a piece of history being put to use. Here in Roxbury, Curley built his political reputation at the turn of the 20th century. 
He started off delivering messages for ward bosses when he was supposed to be delivering groceries. He gained favor by voting early and often down the party line. Soon, he ran for one of the 100 seats on the board of aldermen. Once he was elected, he realized he had power and didn't need the ward bosses. So he started a political club and named it Tammany Hall after the famous machine in New York City. It was from this club that Curley cultivated a following that stuck with him as he sought higher office. Tammany members were fiercely loyal and overlooked his questionable ethics, even as he was grilled by good government groups. The residents of Roxbury saw him spending a lot of the city's budget developing and protecting their neighborhood. So they saw him as a politician, but they also saw him as one of them, and they wanted to see him succeed politically, despite his personal flaws. They wouldn't turn their back on him, even in the face of scandal after scandal. This, some people say, was naive. This year, a local college is working on a digitized version of Curley's mansion. The goal is to create the next best thing to actually entering the closed off house. That is, sitting at a computer and looking at 3D renderings of what the house looked like in the 30s and 40s. They're using emerging technologies to study, catalog, and represent the past. They used high-tech lasers to scan each room and then asked what was here. But history isn't just digging into the archives for details. There are important questions that come after what was here. Why is it gone? Where did it go? And what is here now? Curley's questionable ethics weren't just overlooked by voters, at times, they were celebrated. Here at the Charles Street Jail, Curley served a two-month sentence after he took a civil service exam under a friend's name so that the friend could get a job. He was convicted, ran his campaign for aldermen while awaiting sentencing, and was actually in jail on election day, and he was elected. He was released a few minutes before his sentence was supposed to end so that he could take the oath of office on time, according to Curley's autobiography, when the president of the Board of Aldermen threatened to block Curley's swearing in, Curley implied that he would throw him out the window. Curley was sworn in without incident. Thirty years later, Curley had an office at Hotel Terrain at 62 Boylston Street. On this site, 120 years before that, John Quincy Adams owned a mansion, and there's a plaque here indicating it placed by the city while Curley was mayor. Let me go back to the Curley desk for a minute. It isn't real. Curley used a lot of desks. He was mayor four times, spanning 35 years. So the idea of a Curley desk, a desk from which Curley acted as the heroic mayor of the poor, that there's one desk with special meaning. It's a myth. For his entire career, Curley's goal was the corner office. In 1934, after his third term as mayor,
he was finally elected. Curley was controversial not just because he went to jail, but because he was divisive. He pandered to his constituents, the poor and the Irish, and he exaggerated their opposition of the rich and English to create a culture of ethnic antagonism that dominated Boston for the first half of the 20th century. He manipulated facts to stir emotions, and he manipulated emotions to gain electoral success. But often people focus too much on Curley's ends, which was simply winning elections, that they forget about his results, which were better access to employment, education, and political agency for the city's poor and Irish. Ultimately then, the criticisms of Curley that have been repeated for decades aren't on the substance of his results, but on his political style. And those who most vocally criticize Curley's style had and have the most to lose by his success. After his governorship, Curley ran for office 10 times and lost seven. During his final term as mayor, he was once again sent to federal prison, this time on a fraud charge. A lot of people saw the charges against Curley as being a sort of makeup charge for all the graft the government knew Curley had been guilty of throughout his career, but couldn't prove. Eight years after his last day in office, Curley died. He's buried here, near this rock with his name on it. And there are lots of other things in Boston with Curley's name on them. While he was mayor and governor, countless construction projects took place. Bridges, towers, monuments. Curley's name is all over this city. And this is how we remember and mark history. We write it down and put it in public places for people to look at. They say history is written by the winners but a pithy sentence can't sum up the truth. History is told by those who have power, yes, but the important thing to remember is why. They tell it in ways that helps them keep it. They pick who the heroes and villains are. They tell stories because stories have logic, cause and effect, and when you look back after the end of a story, you're supposed to realize it was always inevitable, and it all worked out for the best. An artist recently wrote, Stop looking for history and objects. Stop looking for reality and images. Stop looking for truth and facts. <laughs>